Okay, so, well, thanks so much. First of all, thanks so much, Stephen, for the invitation. I'm really uh, glad uh, to be here to share with you briefly, uh, like a whole story of the Chiapas state. And what I'm going to share with you to, tonight is uh, uh, pretty much an, uh, a summary of uh, the research that we have been, do been doing in this area for the last perhaps seven years, along with my students. Uh, my students are actually co-authors of this, of this abstract. One of them is Rogelio Snar, eh, Hernandez. He's finishing his PhD at UNAM. Marco is doing a master's on the Motocintla Shearson, and Norma Betani is also another PhD. And, and so I put together a lot of the, of the research that we, have, that we have been doing in this region. And this talk in which I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the role of the structural inheritance of the tectonic evolution of Chiapas, Mexico, from the Paleozoic Pangea assembly to Mesozoic rifting and Cenozoic shortening in basin inversion. The uh, topics that I will be addressing in this talk include these uh, four points. I'll talk a little bit about the tectonic framework, then a review of the stratigraphy of Chiapas, to have an idea, to have a flavor of the history, of the geological history of this region. Then I'll talk to you about the major tectonic events in this region. So the principal, because in my opinion, there are more uh, episodes of the formation that we have not addressed yet. We know they happen, but we don't quite uh, understand them yet. And then finally, I'll talk about the role of the structural heritage in the tectonic evolution of Southern Mexico. Uh, particularly from the very southern Mexico, uh, from the perspective from the south, south to the north, uh, uh, from Chiapas to the north of Mexico. So this is a figure in which I'm uh, briefly going to explain to you the tectonic framework of the area that I will be talking about. This area is located right where you see that uh, white square um, is located right at the triple junction between the North American the Cocos and the Caribbean plate. So right in the region where the subduction zone between the, the Cocos plate and the North American plate, you know, uh, merges somehow the uh, uh, transformant uh, edge between the Caribbean and the North American plate, which is a sinistral uh, fault uh, transform uh, transformant uh, fault system that you can see uh, in this region. Uh, Besides the structures that are active nowadays, you know, we see, you know, these structures that are oriented, these faults, you know, these, these uh, lineaments that are oriented northwest southeast. And as you can see over here, you know, they seem to be the continuation of these transform faults that are uh, mapped here in blue, which coincide with the transform faults that assisted the opening of the Gulf of Mexico, and of course, the rotation of the Yucatan block. Uh, so I'll be talking to you about this region. Just one thing to remember is that there are a lot of structures here that are northwest, southeast oriented in this region. So the, if we review this uh, stratigraphic chart from the state of Chiapas, we can have, you know, like a general idea on, on the evolution of this region. Okay. So the first part of this stratigraphic table includes the basement, which, as you can see here, includes three different uh, groups of rocks, rocks of the Chiapas Massif, uh, which is the crystalline basement that is exposed in the southernmost part of Chiapas. This uh, basement is covered by a sedimentary uh, package of Mississippian to Permian rocks, which were strongly deformed during the Permian Triassic. Okay, these are not metamorphic or igneous rocks, these are sedimentary rocks. Uh, but are nonetheless included uh, as part of the basement in this chart. And then we have to the North Mayan uh, terrain, which is little known uh, as there are only few boreholes uh, from Pemex that have reached these rocks. And there are some, uh, there is some information about uh, the nature, the igneous or metamorphic nature of this uh, basement and ages no, that uh, are uh, Pan-African, like, are grouped in the Pan-African circa. But we don't know much about the structure or the heterogeneity of the Maya terrain or whether it has the same nature of the Chiapas Massif. Because of the exposures of the Chiapas Massif, we know that it not only includes Permian uh, granodiorites or tonalites, uh, 
as uh, many people think, you know, that this, this is a batholith. It's actually a um, heterogeneous body that includes mesoproterozoic gneisses and orthocytes, ediacaran, uh, metasedimentary, metavolcanic uh, rocks uh, that were metamorphosed in amphibolitic phases. It also includes uh, Ordovician, Devonian, uh, metamorphic and, and igneous rocks. And finally, all of these rocks are, you know, put together are glued with the Permian uh, batholitic rocks, okay? So these are crystalline from the structural perspective. These are very important because they have a very particular rheology compared uh, to the rocks of the sedimentary cover. These rocks are unconformably covered by uh, early Jurassic uh, volcanic and volcanic clastic rocks. Then by uh, red beds of the Todos Santos formation, which uh, have an age range that goes all the way from the middle Jurassic to, to the late Jurassic, and that in part uh, formed by red beds, but uh, sandstone mostly, but also locally conglomerate, uh, siltstone and evaporites in the top of, of, of in the middle part and, and the top of, the, of, the, of this unit. These uh, continental deposits, which were formed during an extensional phase, which is actually related with the opening of the Gulf of Mexico, are then covered by carbonates that were deposited during the drift uh, stage of the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, so this stratigraphic column includes carbonates uh, all through the, the Cretaceous times, and they have different phases. Some of them are shallow water, some are deeper water. Some even include uh, the trital deposits like the Ocosocuautla phases that are deposited in the upper Cretaceous. This package of rocks are in turn uh, covered by relatively deep water turbidites of the soja low formation, which is paleogene, paleocene in age, uh, which rapidly change phases to shallower water conditions during the Eocene, even in parts to continental conditions, uh, which is evidenced by the deposition of El Bosque formation, uh, which is extended pretty much in a big region of Chiapas, except perhaps in the Northeast where we still have dominantly marine deposits. An interesting thing that happens in the Eocene is that, you know, because uh, uh, there are not only these changes in phases from uh, marine to continental, but also there is the occurrence of a patchy regional angular unconformity that is very important because it's telling us that uh, important ob uplift is occurring in this region. These rocks then are covered by marine, transitional, uh, conditions, rocks, you know, uh, in these rocks, uh, which are highly influenced by the trital sediments uh, in the, during the Oligocene and during the Miocene, where we still see marine conditions, uh, deposits, but then start to change dramatically to dominantly continental conditions in the, from the middle to the late Miocene. An interesting thing that happens in the Miocene is also the, the occurrence of these different uh, angular unconformities, which uh, seem to be local. At least they are not very obvious in the northeastern region of Chiapas, but in central Chiapas, they can be pervasive, okay? Uh, these rocks are covered by uh, uh, rocks of the Chiapaneca volcanic art deposits, which are, uh, have a nature range from the uh, Pliocene to the Quaternary. And so we have a, an orogeny that happens during the Permian Triassic that is registered in these uh, rocks, in the Mississippi and Permian rocks of, uh, that are included here in the basement. We have an extensional phase that happened during the, the Jurassic. Then we have an important uplift and shortening during the Eocene. And then we have the Chiapanecan orogeny that occurred during the Miocene, okay? And uh, this, uh, Orogeny is not only characterized by uplift, but also by the important activity of lateral faults in, in the region. Just to give you a flavor on how the rocks that I just described look like in the field, I'll show you some examples of the rocks of the Chicomucelo Fold and Trust Belt, this Permian Triassic Belt that I just mentioned, which includes these fine grain turbidites in, in, the, in, the, in the bottom, which are part of the Santa Rosa Formation, Sealstone and, 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 and limestone of the Grupera formation from the Pennsylvanian early Permian, and these uh, Permian limestones that you see over there. 
Uh, red uh, beds of the Jurassic age are exposed mostly on the southern edge of the depression central of Japan, which is this re relatively flat region that is extended northwest southeast in just the center of the state. It's relatively dry compared to other more selvatic parts of the, of the, of the state. Uh, these occur in the southern uh, part of the, of the depression central and are indicated here with blue. Then we have a, you know, an extensive exposure of carbonates all through the area, area of Chiapas. Uh, which have different phases, as you can see in this diversity of in this collage of photographs that I'm showing you. Uh, we have also these uh, uh, detrital uh, deposits that occur during the Paleogene, during the, the Paleocene, the, the, the turbidites of the Soyalo Formation, El Bosque, the Lomut, San Juan, and in, 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 in San Juan formations in the uh, late Eocene, early Oligocene. Then we have terrigenous also deposits during the neogen. And these are some examples of all these different events. And with that brief review, I'm now gonna move to the point number three of my presentation, which is the longest, and includes a brief description of these different events that, that I just mentioned on the basis of stratigraphic analysis, which include this Permian Triassic orogeny, which gave place to, to the Chicomucello fold and Trust Belt, uh, rocks, that evidence the early, early Jurassic extension and then the opening of the Gulf of Mexico or are, are, are related to this event. Paleocene contraction, the Miocene, uh, Chiapaneca orogeny, and then a little bit about recent tectonics. Okay, so with respect to the first uh, rocks or the first uh, orogeny, which gave place to the Chicomucello fold and Trust Belt, uh, I must mention that our research was based on this little rectangle here in the southernmost Chiapas that you can see over here. Uh, this 60 by 40 kilometers uh, uh, rectangle, you know, is the largest exposure of, of Permian sedimentary, uh, Mississippian and Permian sedimentary rocks in Mexico, actually. But uh, these rocks are not only exposed in this little area, but rather, you know, they, have been reported pretty much across the central part of the of, of Guatemala, and even there are some uh, rocks of the same age that have been correlated with them in the Mayan mountains in Belize. Uh, similar rocks to those exposed in this region are also uh, have also been reported in that, in some boreholes in this region of Mexico, in such a way that this feature is not only you know. Uh, regionally, so it's not only of tens of kilometers, no? but has a length of about 500 kilometers and a, a width perhaps of about uh, 100 to 200 kilometers. So it's not little. But I'm going to talk about what we saw, what we observed in, you know, in this little rectangle in Southern Mexico, where you can see the exposure of this greenish, orange and pink colored rocks, which correspond to the Mississippian fine grain turbidites of the Santa Rosa formation, a, a silstone and sandstone interbedded with limestone of the Grupera formation. And then we have these limestone layers that were uh, deposited in an isoclinal ramp of the Paso Hondo formation, which are the units that constitute this bell. They are folded, folded, foliated, and these rocks and the structures then are finally eroded away and unconformably covered by the Jurassic red beds, which are mapped over here with this pale blue that you can see, okay? So on the basis of this angular unconformity, we know that this feature is pre-Jurassic, okay? And to better understand the structure of this belt, uh, we carry the systematic observations across this section from A to A prime. And uh, this is our summary on how we think this uh, structure looks like in depth on the basis of the structural features that we observed on surface. So the rocks are uh, disposed in this uh, wedge shape, which we interpret as a wedge shape uh, slate belt, you know, a slate belt because it's mostly it mostly includes these fine grain rocks of the Santa Rosa formation, which has about of 3000 meters in thickness. And then on top of it, we have the Grupera and Paso Hondo formations folded and thrust, you know, in, 
the trust that we observe in the upper part are shallow, are shallowly dipping to the west in general, although they are also locally folded, just like the folds. Okay, so most of the volume of this of this feature seem to be um, uh, 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 is constituted by that, but by, by this fine grain slate belt uh, developing the Santa Rosa formation. One interesting thing that we observed in this structure, in this in this tectonic element, is that there is a gradient of deformation, which is increasing, progressively increasing towards the south of the section. So we have faults and troughs, which accuse northeast directed uh, uh, contraction. But as we move to the south, the faults and the axial plane foliation is substituted by a shear related foliation which mixes blocks of, of the rocks, uh, of the Mississippi and Permian rocks with even blocks, you know, uh, of the crystalline basement in a shear zone that is about five kilometers thick and that we are describing in a paper that we just submitted as the Mototzintla shear zone. So the Mototzintla shear zone is part of this element as well. And this puts in contact the crystalline basement with uh, the fault trust belt wedge that constitutes the Chicomucelo belt over here. These uh, photographs that you see underneath, you know, are evidence of the structures, you know, the typical faults and troughs that we observe in this, uh, in, the, in the Eastern exposures of the fault trust belt. But as we move to the South, we start to see, you know, a dominant shear related foliation that at some point even, you know, destroys, completely destroys the stratigraphical order or even the texture of the rocks uh, to develop this uh, foliation, this very strong foliation in which we see this classical fabric of blocking matrix sort of a uh, fabric uh, within the, the Mototzint last year. So uh, because of its width, so it's, it has a width of about three, four kilometers and a length, exposed length of about 30 kilometers in, in the Mototzintla region. Uh, we think this represents one of the, of the most important weakness uh, zones in Southern Chiapas. And we also believe that it played a role in the development of later basins, such as this Jurassic basin that is on top of here, you know, because it's uh, located right at the Southern edge of these basins. And because it permits, you know, the passage of magmatic fluids over here that are eventually interbedded at the base of the, of the Todo Santos formation in this area, uh, but not on the other side of the basin. Okay, that's the reason why we, we believe this weakness on, you know, uh, played a major role in the later structures that developed in the region. Some of these dikes in the vicinity of the shear zone are north-south oriented, okay? And that would be consistent with the reactivation of this fault with a dextral, cell, dextral sense of movement, movement, just like many uh, of the transform faults that are uh, observed farther uh, west, okay? That's, uh, so we carry that structural analysis to see if there was kinematic compatibility between the rocks in the fault trust belt and rock in the Mototzintla shear zone. And yes, all of them are consistent with a direction of shortening from south to north. As you can see here, it has a, a reverse component as it permits that the rocks of the crystalline basement trust over the, of the Permian units but also has a dextral component, this fault. That's very important. So we have an oblique fault trust belt. Uh, in order to determine the age of this, of this belt, we carried a detailed analysis of elite that grew uh, contemporaneously to the formation. Okay, so we collected samples from the Santa Rosa formation. You can see here that the Santa Rosa formation is completely folded on the grain scale. And that the foliation is slightly, you know, crenulated by later ev events. Uh, we collected a sample from rocks like this. We looked at them in the electronic microscope and saw that all the light, which is relatively thick, is even sericite, you know, like grains, you know, very thick and very crystalline material that uh, was developed that precipitated parallel to the foliation. 
okay? So because this material has potassium in it, we can date it with argon-argon or with, potass with potassium-argon, but in this case, we used argon-argon. But besides these large flakes associated to the first foliation, we also found these tiny elite, hairy, you know, polytypes of elite that grew transversally or perpendicularly to the first foliation, presumably during a second deformation event and because of the, 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 their orientation coincides with the axial plane of the crenulations, we believe that it coincides with this second foliation that we observed in this angle. So because we have large grains and small grains, what we did is select a sample from the oldest and the youngest uh, rocks of the belt, separated grain size fractions, hoping that the, the largest uh, you know, grain size would concentrate the oldest silite and the, and the finest grain size fraction would concentrate the youngest delight. And even if we cannot be able to isolate the two populations, we still, you know, by quantifying the polytypes of these two and member types of elight and uh, determining the age and plotting them, you know, with this percentage of two and one elight or the elight that is the largest or more and more crystalline type of elight, we could be able to obtain a mixed age line like this. And by extrapolating this line up and down, we can obtain the ages of the oldest population of elite and the youngest population of elite. And so we did this exercise in the oldest uh, unit. We obtained this regression line like this. So we have mixed ages in the different grades and fractions. We did that for the Santa Rosa and for the Paso Hondo formations. And if we compare them, you know, they pretty much are the same within the error of the method. And those, uh, what these results show is that both units show the same populations of elite that indicate that the elite that is associated with the first foliation has an age of about 200 million years, okay? But the youngest have an age that is Jurassic. Actually, that might suggest that this tiny elite perhaps uh, grew during the reactivations of the structures of this belt during the opening of the Gulf of Mexico, or a little bit earlier. Uh, Dr. Pindel would, would tell us more about that, perhaps. Uh, okay, so other studies that have been carrying, carried in these uh, rocks by other authors, in this case by Weber et al, 2007, although they also have more detailed studies in another work of 2009 and another from 2006. Anyway, so they, in some of the samples of the Santa Rosa formation, determine a maximum depositional age between two, 325 and 315 million years, but also from circa of the trital circon ages between 420 to 360, 70 to 500, which are Pan-African ages, and also Proterozoic ages, and even some Archean. And on the basis of these different circa of the trital circon, ages, uh, Lawton and collaborators in 2001, you know, reconstructed the paleogeography for uh, the basin in which these units were deposited. And one interesting thing is that before this reconstruction, these basins were uh, connected with Permian and Mississippian basins from Southern US. However, uh, because of the populations of circons that they have, you know, uh, they think, you know, these basins are isolated for that time. So it, because they don't share the same populations of circons, and then they cite this basin in a sort of backyard basin uh, that was uh, the result of subduction of uh, the Pantalasan uh, oceanic plate on the west under uh, pretty much Pangaea, no? almost. 100% consolidated Pangaea. We then consider their vision and the paleogeographic reconstructions based on the analysis of metamorphic terrains and more than the metamorphic terrains on the evolution and timing of activity of these faults that you see over here. One of them is also a lithospheric fault system, which is known as the Caltepec fault. The other fault that is uh, present in the metamorphic terrains of Mexico is the Oaxaca fault. Actually, the Oaxaca fault 
also has a, uh, well, the, the Caltepec fault uh, reported a dextra sense of movement, movement for uh, 2070, perdón, 270 million years. The Oaxacan actually developed a very strong, strong fabric in which muscovite grew uh, on a lineation that is horizontal and has a dextral sense of movement and uh, was dated by Susana Alanis uh, a, a few decades ago in uh, 169 million years, just the timing of the opening of the Gulf of Mexico. Actually, I don't know if this is true, but this is one of the very few lithospheric structures in Mexico that you know have been actually dated and obtained the timing of the opening of the Gulf of Mexico. So we don't know what was the original kinematics of this fault, but it was certainly reactivated during the opening of the Gulf of Mexico. And along with these faults, you know, and pretty much with the same uh, orientation, we have also the Mototint last year's on, and it also has dextral kinematics, you know, for this time. We haven't dated yet this uh, fault, but uh, by association with the Chicomucello fault in Trosbel, we believe uh, it might have an, a Permian age. Okay. And this is the location that we think the Chicomucello fault in Trosbel. Uh, could have had before uh, the Jurassic because, uh, and perhaps some of these faults were reactivated, certainly the Oaxaca fault was. Uh, and if we consider the, the, the estimates for the rotation of the Yucatan block along these transform faults, you know, of uh, 45 degrees according to Pindel or uh, 60 to 70 degrees according to Molina Garza, you know, then no matter which one you use, you still will end up with an orientation that is very close to what we see nowadays in Southern Chiapas, which is Northwest Southeast. Okay. And after, after that uh, happened, uh, then we have an extensional phase that was very important and that has been recorded, has been documented in different localities along and across Mexico which happened during the early Jurassic, and that some authors like Barbosa Gudiño in this model have associated to the uh, uh, changes in the dynamics of subduction of the Paleo-Pacific. Uh, I don't know which exact plate is this one, eh, by the way, but um, uh, uh, changing the angle of, of, of the subducting plate from the Pacific side, uh, perhaps, perhaps to a, a deeper angle, which caused an, 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 you know, an extension that was pretty much affecting the entire uh, country, perhaps even Chiapas, no? And I'll uh, tell you what is the evidence for that. This event then was uh, followed by the activity of these transform and falls and the rotation of, of the Yucatan block, which uh, was related uh, to the opening of the Gulf of Mexico okay. during the middle uh, Jurassic. Uh, these are some of the evidence of the deposits that uh, have been reported, but in my opinion, not yet deeply studied in, in, in Chiapas, uh, in which we have, we see, you know, an example of this sandstone, uh, conglomerate uh, sandstone, layers interbedded with sealstone, some uh, andesites interbedded with these units, and even some evaporates in the upper part of, of, of these deposits. But underneath the Todos Santos formation, this is the Todos Santos formation, the pictures that I just showed to you, uh, Godinez Urban and collaborators also reported the occurrence of another unit, which is dominantly volcanic and volcanic plastic, so, uh, which he named La Silla Formation, which, which has an age from 196 to 171 million years which might be presumably related to this, uh, you know, early Jurassic ex extensional phase that, you know, affected pretty much uh, the entire uh, country. And with that, excuse me, I'm going to, to move to the Chiapas Fold in Trosbel, which represents some of the youngest uh, structures in Chiapas. Uh, the Chiapas Fold and Trust Belt is mostly distributed in the northern part of Chiapas, as you can see in this geological map. This is a synthetic map in which we see the structures that constitute this belt, which are mostly faults, 
and uh, lateral faults, some normal faults like the tenosique, but uh, some lateral faults, uh, which uh, you know are exposed mostly here in the edges in both sides of the central depression, here along the tenosique fault. Some of these faults even have some branches, you know, that you can see here in the Provincia de Fallas Laterales or the, the lateral faults province of the belt. So it's a belt that is not only constituted by faults and trust, but also by lateral faults. That's the message to take. The faults of this belt, you know, in general are so parallel to the lateral faults, and that's a curiosity. And sometimes when, then, when they approach large uh, faults, such as the Polochic faults, as you can see over here in the, to the south, you know, the faults tend to orient with it, tend to be parallel with it. And something similar happens, you know, in central Chiapas. The axis of the faults tend to be so parallel to, to, to the faults. Um, and uh, in many parts, the lateral fault seems to cut, you know, to go uh, through the fault to the fault axis and locally rotate. We carried a structural analysis in different faults from different regions across and along the belt. And uh, no matter what we carry this analysis, in general, in average, you know, uh, the faults that we observe in, in this region accuse a uh, southwest northeast uh, directed uh, direction of shortening. Uh, to the south, the faults are, you know, have wavelengths of kilometers and have rounded hinges in general in this region of central Chiapas. But to the north, they tend to have, you know, sometimes this box shaped uh, as they are related to fault wind faults, no? sort of geometries that you can see over here. And uh, when we see this uh, fault wind faults uh, type of, uh, of uh, structures, you know, we carried also some kinematic analysis in some ramps and flats and lateral ramps that we observed in this region and all of them are also kinematically consistent with a northeast southeast directed uh, uh, contraction. With regards to the lateral faults, in general, you know, in the outcrops that we observe across Chiapas, they are cross cutting the faults. And these lateral faults, which are named here, you know, and you can see their distribution over here and the places where we carried some detailed kinematic analysis they all report both dextra, sinestral, and even normal kinematics, different generations of spria. And uh, in general, the dextral are the oldest, the sinestral are the, the following ones, and then the youngest are the normal, the normal component. We know these systems, or they are considered in general as be a sinestral system, and the entire fault thrust belt to be a a sinestral wrench tectonic related fold and thrust belt, you know, as a whole is considered like a giant flower structure. But we still don't believe uh, that. And I'm, I'm gonna tell you why. First of all, because we see cross-cutting relationships between the right lateral or the left lateral folds, you know, across and along the belt. There is a lot of places where we see cross-cutting relationships, sometimes parallel to the axis, sometimes transversal, uh, which are more obvious with regards to displacements and things like that. But also, you know, because it's very strange to have faults pretty much with the same length as lateral faults and being parallel to them. That could require a lot of displacement to reorient the faults and make them parallel to the lateral faults. And also because when we have uh, systems of structures dominated by lateral faulting, you know, typically the, the faults are, you know, secondary or subsidiary to the lateral faults. They are smaller, they are in natural on arrays, and they are not parallel, but rather they make a, a small angle with the lateral fault system. You know? Like in this uh, drawing that I show you to the left, which, you know, we don't see in the entire belt, but you see uh, what we, we see sometimes locally, like, in this little in echelon arrays of uh, faults that we see in the central depression, those I believe that can be related to the sinestral tectonics. And we can see some here, on the, even here in Cerro Pelon, perhaps, you know, this tiny, uh, this smaller structure, smaller scale faults uh, could be, you know, 
uh, an echelon array is associated with the sinestral activity of faults, especially in this case, because it's assisted by salt tectonics, you know, the, these are a little bit more complex structure. But, um, but yeah, so that, those are our, our reasons why we don't think that the faults are uh, of the same age as the lateral faults. But also because they are not kinematically compatible. If we have all these three parallel structures, you know, with faults, lateral faults, like with textual kinematics or with kin sinestral kinematics, you know, and we determine by using, you know, simple Andersonian theory, you know, the direction of, of maximum contraction, you know, it's just like, th these structures just don't make sense to be formed uh, together, but rather they seem to be part of an evolutionary, uh, an, a tectonic scenario that is evolving in time, perhaps, perhaps, eh? I don't know <laughs> quite yet, from a subduction dominated to wrench tectonics dominated on the other side. But uh, for instance, these dextral component faults, we yet don't quite understand them. Anyway, so with this in mind, and with the idea of proving that actually uh, these uh, uh, faults uh, predate faulting, we collected 16 samples within the fault rust belt. From those 60 samples, only four of them, you know, provided with good delight. We delight actually, because most of them have only esmectite. It's a very shallow uh, orogenic belt. It, it's not, uh, it wasn't buried a lot. Uh, and it, 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 because of this thermal, you know, the really cool thermal conditions, it did not produce sufficient delight. Only we found in these uh, localities, these four samples, one uh, on the front uh, to the back and in this area. The samples were studied by means of, uh, you know, uh, electro, uh, electron mi uh, microscopy to, to make sure that the lights that grew, you know, uh, uh, in these samples was parallel to the foliation related to bed parallel shear during flexural folding. We avoided lateral folds because we presumed they, they were younger and this method doesn't have a resolution for, for very young structures. So we didn't want to waste our time or our money. So we focus mostly on, on fold, folded structures. And uh, by analyzing these samples, we, we saw that notice that some of the samples only have elite that was formed during the deformation event. It didn't have any detrital elite, but others, others did have some uh, uh, flakes of uh, detrital Moscovi. Nonetheless, we carried the same, you know, regression, mixing line analysis, mixing age analysis, in all of the samples that we analyzed. And uh, we obtained, you know, very convincing ages that go all the way from 38 million to 58 million. So these ages indicate that the faults that we observe in the Chiapas fault and trust belt are uh, Eocene in age, mostly. That doesn't mean that the Chiapaneca orogeny didn't happen. It's just, uh, it just tell, it's, it's telling that the faults are a little bit older. These ages that we found are consistent with the presence of this regional and patchy uh, angular unconformity that is observed in the belt. Also with ages of uh, cooling that were determined in the Todos Santos formation here in this, in this locality that we observe on this region. Also a, a cooling ages that were determined on the basis of fission track and uh, helium apatite and zircon ages that were obtained in the Chiapas Massif, but also in the Paleogene deposits on this region. All of them show that there is, you know, an event of cooling, you know, that happened, you know, pretty much or overlaps with the range of uh, ages that we obtain for uh, the faults uh, observed in this uh, Chiapas fold and trust belt. And uh, we think that the uplift that this folding might have caused perhaps was not much. And one line of evidence for that is the fact that there are some plants association, some paleobotanical associations in these deposits of the Eocene, which suggest that the elevations that were reached during the deposition of these rocks uh, didn't overcome 700 meters above the sea level. Nowadays, these rocks are above 3,000 meters above the sea level. So which means that the uh, 
uh, uplift did not stop in the Eocene, but rather just started and then continue. And actually the most important uplifting happened during the Chiapan Echanology and perhaps is happening now. Okay. And with that, I'm gonna be, we know that it's happening now because there is evidence of seismic activity along these faults, you know, of course of the Polochic faults, but also there are some uh, uh, focal mechanisms that have been reported along these trays and along these trays too. Okay, bueno. We, with all this information that I just shared with you, I just want to, to share you the idea that uh, I, I just want you to, 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 to play a little bit with this figure. Notice that Northeast is in that direction. Okay, so the North is in that direction. Okay, so we are looking here an schematic block of the central depression of Chiapas in which we see the buried structures of the Chicomucelo fold and trust belt, you know, perhaps of the Mototzintla shear zone passing through the depression central of Chiapas over here. And uh, we see the, the southern edge of the Jurassic basins over here. Okay, so we think that the prior the Jurassic, we have this uh, weakness zone, buried, perhaps under, under, under these deposits, and perhaps this reactivated, we don't know how so at first, if as a normal or, uh, or as a, a uh, the extra fault zone. Uh, we, we have no idea on how was the original kinematics, but we do know that at 174 million, there were uh, these dikes north-south oriented over here, which suggests that this fault might have reactivated as a transform fault. Okay, this is something that we just recently discovered like a few weeks ago that we went to the field work. And there are some, uh, there is emplacement of dikes you know, on this orientation along, even if it is not exposed on the northern side, you know, we still can see in some parts these north-south oriented dikes. And um, this might suggest or might be consistent with this uh, uh, dextral direction of transport. We haven't dated them all. We just have one age, one of them. So it's perhaps too soon to say anything else about it. But anyway, so we think that this, uh, uh, this structure could have been reactivated in this region uh, during the Jurassic, you know, it, 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 during either the extensional phase or uh, during the uh, opening of the Gulf of Mexico, during the activation of the transform faults. Uh, that uh, configuration associated with these faults also, you know, control quite a bit the distribution of evaporitic deposits. Uh, in the middle to late Jurassic in the region. Uh, and on top of them, we then had the deposition of the uh, carbonates during the Cretaceous, okay? Which uh, during the, e the Eocene, Paleocene Eocene, uh, were perhaps shortened uh, along the Northeast Southwest direction, okay? Forming the touch faults and shallow angle uh, thrusts that we observe in the, in the Chiapas fold and thrust belt. And then we have during the Miocene, the um, reactivation of the Jura already reactivated Jurassic fault uh, during the Chiapaneca orogeny, which caused the differential uplift of uh, different Northwest Southeast oriented blocks within the Chiapas uh, fault and trust belt. Then uh, just to finalize this idea of having different structures in this region, with a history of reactivation, I'm gonna show you a different line of evidence that we are collecting. And this is based on a totally different uh, line of uh, thinking. Uh, we are not uh, thinking about the structural evidence on, uh, based on observations of, of outcrops or even maps, but rather on the reactivation of a structure, which is not even evidence, you know, in, uh, in a thin section, unless we carry it a uh, detailed cathodoluminescence analysis in them. So what we did is to analyze the structures that we knew for sure, because we dated previously with the light uh, as Permian, 
okay? And in those structures, we studied different generations of veins and cements and placed in this rock volume on the grain scale and dated the calcite with uranium lead. And with that, uh, we were able to realize that actually uh, there is evidence of reactivation of these Permian Triassic structures um, uh, on, on the great scale, in a scale that is not pretty obvious for us. So in an outcrop like this, we collected several samples like this A, B, C, D, they characterize different sets of, of generations uh, of veins on the basis of cross-cutting relationships and kinematics. Then we analyze the, the cements in these veins, obtain ages, and these ages in general, in summary, you know, indicate that these rocks, you know, produced uh, or were deformed by pressure solution and solution transfer and produced cements that, uh, you know, precipitated during the Permian Triassic during this orogeny related to the assembly of Pangaea. Then we have another generation of cements within the same outcrop. Sometimes it's obvious because we see just a tiny little lateral fold superimposed to the, to the belt. Sometimes we don't even see that. We just see the cement with a different age, which coincides with the timing of La Silla formation or the early Cretaceous. Uh, then we have also evidence of cements uh, which are Jurassic, not in this outcrop. In others, we have been able to actually find folds in placed in these rocks, large faults with particular types of cement that we can, you know, after seeing so many rocks, we are able to distinguish them, which have a middle Jurassic age. And then we actually even can see cements that are 15, about 15, 16 million years that are related to the early uh, stages of activity of the Pologic fault in this region. So, not only we can see that on the map scale, but also it is possible sometimes if we look carefully, you know, to find evidence of reactivation of structures in the, in the, in the, in, on the grain scale cement. Um, with that, I'm just going to list these few conclusions from, from this talk. Uh, the first one is that uh, we believe that uh, a first generation of structure in southern North Chiapas were north-south oriented shortening structures that formed during the Permian Triassic, during the uh, neurogeny related to the very last stages or, of consolidation of Pangaea, presumably related to the subduction of the Pantalassian uh, Oceanic Cross on the Western Pangaea. Uh, we think so uh, because uh, of the association and the parallelism of these structures and the Permian Triassic uh, arc of Mexico, which also has the same orientation and is located to the west and which has been presumably related to, to the subduction of this oceanic crust. Uh, then we have structures of the Chicomucela fold and trust belt, such as the Mototzintla shear zone, which is a weakness zone, perhaps a lito lithospheric uh, fault that uh, might have been reactivated as a normal and then as a transform fault during the Jurassic and which rotated Counterclockwise to achieve eventually its current northwest southeast orientation. Uh, then we have, uh, we think that perhaps these structures might have localized, you know, uh, 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 the formation that uh, eventually, you know, determined the extension of the Salina Basin, therefore of the salt deposits, and therefore condition, you know, the distribution. Uh, of the or, or, or the area rather uh, in which the touch faults in shallow angle transform faults could be formed within the Chiapas fault and trust belt during the Paleogene. And finally, we think that uh, the faults uh, that are northwest south, southeast oriented, especially the larger ones uh, that were active during the Miocene, might reflect actually or might be you know a direct reflect of the localization of uh, their Jurassic faults um, underneath. And with that, I am going to thank you uh, a lot for your attention. And uh, I thank also all my colleagues that in different ways have supported uh, this research. Uh, thank you, Stephen and Alisa for your attentions during the organization of this talk. And then I, I can be ready to take some questions.
I can hear you, Stephen. Uh oh. Forgot to unmute. <laughs> Okay, I'll ask the first question and other people can ask questions. I'll come up in my chat room there at the bottom and I'll, and I'll have uh, Elisa answer me. Uh, with res essentially the Pulachek Fault uh, subdivides Guatemala uh, in a north-south direction, northern Guatemala, with respect to southern Gu uh, Guatemala, northern Guatemala is essentially moving to the east, whereas southern Gu Guatemala working to the rest. That would make that a, a, a Sinistral fault. Uh, right. When you have, hold on. Usually, when you have a situation where you have a, 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 a plate edge fault, transform fault that kind of goes in like it's going to the northwest, the, uh, the, the transform fault will tend to braid and you get a lot of uh, relatively, uh, I'd say, normal faults. That's what you see along the uh, north end of the San Andreas Fault because it ends against the Mendocino Shear. Right. What you end up with is a series of pull, little pull apart basins and normal normal faults that get reactivated almost at high angle. And is that kind of what you're seeing here? And is that is that what's interplaying also? Because now you have in late in the late sense you get this neogene uh, subduction that's it's overprinting everything else. Is that what you're seeing? Yes. Yes. There are actually. You know, I still I must confess that I still don't understand you know, uh, whether, let me just show you a map. Yeah. Like for instance, in this map, no? Yeah. So like, uh, let me see if I can find something better. So uh, one thing that intrigues me about, uh, no, no, I think I, I picked the wrong one. So one thing that intrigues me, probably this works better. Yes. Intrigues me is like you have the polo cheek fall right here, mm -hmm. and then you see these little branches, you know, this this horse tail or ponytail, no? Right. Like like that, no? Yes. Uh, with faults that are active, actually, like the necta fault over here and this other fault over there. Okay, that you know they have evidence, like you know, of activity of recent activity, uh, uh, such as these, uh, you know, dog leg shape. Uh, rivers or creeks, you know, displaced by the by the falls, um, or they cross cut the races that indicate that these are active and they they, they, they have uh, sinistral kinematics. However, you know, you have these other long faults over here, which you know, uh, even though they they seem to have also evidence to be active nowadays, they have just very little displacement, you know. Uh, if you if you look carefully at the rivers and how much displacement they produce in this uh, dock leg uh, shape, this is too, very little, uh, and that's the reason. And that doesn't make sense with the length that they have. You know, that's one of the reasons, one of the evidences that suggests that these recent faults are actually reactivating mm -hmm. uh, faults that are buried underneath. But another array that is very interesting in this uh, lateral fault system is this array of the Malpaso fault. This, this blue fault, this long fault over here, which eventually here in central Chiapas ramificate, it branches out, if you see, but makes another ponytail or horsetail termination that is, has a different orientation as the polo cheek fault. So when you see these arrays, that makes me wonder if these two fault system are actually activated or if they, if they were active uh, simultaneously. Okay, or if we have some other inherited features over here in this region that are actually preventing for, from connection. Uh, the kinematics, so in this region right over here, there is a lot of uplift, but actually, you know, the connection of these faults that go around the Altos Cuchumatanes, or even these faults over here, you know, their connection, the direct connection to the Polochic fault, is not very clear around this uplift. So, so I, I, I'm not sure, that makes me wonder whether these long folds that we see across the Chiapas Fault Trust Bed really belong or are connected to the Polo Chic system on the entire scale of the fault or not really. So I don't know if, if I, 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 I answered to your question or made it more complicated. 
Uh, no, you. St uh, I'm still alive, I assume. No, it, it looks like they're horsetailing, just like you say. Uh, mm -hmm. Chiapas has been kind of a, a between area between Guatemala, which is the foreland that's less disturbed, and, and right. the area to the to the north, which is the offshore Mexico, which has the huge fields in it. And I remember mapping when I got into Western Guatemala. It's very difficult to get seismic data. Almost it was impossible, essentially in the hill area. You have some fields there, the Rubasano field, the Chinaha field there, kind of where Guatemala is running east west, mm -hmm. part of the Mexican foreland. But when you get to the west into the Chiapas area, uh, the geology gets more problematical for petroleum geology because it's too busted up. You got long folds, but you have a problem trying to get fetch area from these folds to get large fields. And I think the, the, the Chiapas area has had small and gas fields, they're just not real big fields compared to what you have in the offshore. Right. And and then the other thing that we don't understand is exactly how how the Polo Chic continues to the west over here. Because the Mototzin last year's on this discontinuity has this orientation. Yeah. And when they they, they they both come together, actually, if you're in the field trying to map the Polo Chic, trying to follow, like strictly follow the Polo Chic fault, is very hard because uh, I think because of the mechanical contrast caused by this uh, tectonic boundary that the Mototzintla uh, fault zone represents. Okay. Yeah, what would have really been good for Chiapas is for a petroleum system would have been if you had a late salt deposit come in there and just seal everything off because when you get that uh, uh, section that busted up and, and it become, becomes difficult to get a good seal uh, mm -hmm. You don't have that in some areas where you do. Of course, you have giant fields, but then in the offshore Mexico, is this, it has a transpessional regime too. The biggest field you have there offshore is in that area to the north is is actually transpessional feature. Okay, well, it's been very interesting. Does anybody else have any questions? Uh, I guess not. Most people aren't as familiar with me as, as this part of the uh, world because I've mapped Guatemala. I've also mapped uh, the Mexican area. So I guess if there's no other questions, uh, I'll go ahead and, and thank you for your, your talk. To me, it was a very good one. Uh, to, like I said, this yeah. has been kind of a vacancy strip in, in my knowledge of what goes on. I, I knew that fault systems went into that area. You know, I'm familiar with, with that uh, area west of the Yucatan. But this has always been a kind of confusing area for me. So, uh, uh, but thanks, this has been a very good talk, very good structure talk. Uh, a lot of times people don't go into the structure, which to me is one of the most important things about it, especially there are the fields there in Southern Guatemala, which are basically uh, uh, ranch folds come off that uh, Polygy Fault. Okay, yeah. we're getting some good, yeah. Uh, people are saying- Thanks yeah, so much. Yeah, <laughs> crops, uh, a lot of info, very enjoyable talk. So people have, that did watch it like it. So I guess that's it, uh, unless uh, you have more to add or somebody else has more. I says, when's the field trip? <laughs> Somebody <laughs> wants to know when you go to the field. <laughs> yeah, perhaps we can do something together with uh, with P with uh, Jim Pindel and his group. He, they are also doing a lot of of important work in this region for yeah, many Jim, years. Jim's a very good structural geologist. I met Jim must be 50, I know. 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, uh, in fact, I know I met him in uh, in the early two thousands. He didn't know who I was, but he learned very quick. <laughs> Yeah. He's a good man. Good geology. I really enjoyed this talk. Yeah. So, uh, well, I enjoy giving it to and thanks so much for letting me share the geology of this part of my country. Yeah. Thanks for the invitation. Okay. Well, uh, I'm basically, I'm going to end the talk. We thank you for your talk. We appreciate it very much. Uh, so thank you, Elisa, for giving your talk. I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. Thank you. Bye. All right. Sounds good. Buenas noches. Bye. Gracias. <laughs>